I guess it'd be something like. Running in. <laughs> you know, I see, some, sometimes I see the churches and they open up their services and their preacher runs down the center in the row and they, he comes up there and, and they're just plot, applauding him. And I'm thinking, man, I want some of that one of these days. <laughs> Y'all need to applaud for me. Please don't. I'm just kidding. I'm just hurting. All right. Okay, I think we're ready to go now. Bell leaves, leaves off. Dear Heavenly Father, I will be thy great and holy name. Father, this with humble hearts and bowed heads that we approach our congregation at this time. We pray, Father, that each of us here will rid our minds of the trials and tribulations of this old world and concentrate on the worship service that we are about to enter. Father, we pray that you will lift us up in those things that are righteous and defeat us in those things that are not. We pray, Father, that you will be with Brother Thomas as he stands before us this morning and teaches us this out of your word. Pray in Christ's name. Amen. 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 I appreciate you being here this morning. I'll put the lesson sheets up for the, for the next lesson. Uh, the next week, maybe the week after when we get to it, but it's out there nonetheless. So grab one when you, when you leave today if you haven't already got one. We left off on the church of Pergamon, and we had just finished talking about its uh, strengths and and how they hold they held fast to the name of Christ and their works were good works and uh, they didn't deny the faith and in spite of martyrdom uh, they were faithful we talked about a man named Antipas we don't know who he was uh, but we know he was a martyr and he's pointed out as a martyr uh, we talked about the temptation that they they faced there in Pergamum the text said um, if you, if you need to know, we're in Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 through 17 for this lesson. Uh, the temptation said that it was a place where Satan's throne is. So we talk about the fact that Satan's throne most likely is referring to the fact that Pergamum was considered the center of um, emperor worship. They had a temple uh, built there for emperor worship and... Um, and so, and as far as Satan's throne, it, it represented kind of the epicenter of this um, temptation that they, they faced as far as bowing the knee to Caesar. We talked about the church before that uh, in Smyrna, that they were faithful unto death. This, they didn't bow the knee to, to Caesar, and the, Jesus told them that they're going to be thrown into prison, they're going to be tested. Uh, because they were faithful unto death, and that means they did not submit their worship to Caesar, uh, but they held true to uh, to Christ. Now, here in Pergamum, their temptation also uh, is something that could be faced and conquered. It said, and it says in verse seventeen, "He who overcomes." Okay, so. And it's a possibility. They weren't faced with something that they could not handle. Um, so they had a choice to make. You know, to either compromise their faith, blend in with the evil that's around them, and that way they don't get persecuted. But on the other hand, if they compromise their faith, uh, they're going to face the judgment. Christ, and they'll, and they'll ultimately, their souls will be lost. But the temptation that they face um, is much like what we face today. It's a principle um, that the Christian life is not one that you can escape. Okay? It's not something that you can just come in and out of. Um, but it's something that uh, we must uh, hold true to even in the face of these kind of temptations. Now, we're talking about its weakness now. It's where we left off. It says in verse 14, But I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who, fought, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, 
to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Okay, so anybody remember Balaam and Balak from the Old Testament? This is this is one of the, the things that the children of Israel encountered during their 40 years in the desert and when they were, they were wandering in the wilderness. And, and Balaam was a prophet of the Edomites. And the Edomites, um, you remember from the Old Testament, descended from um, Esau. And the Edomites were across the river, you know, from the, the Israelites, and Balak was their king. And Balak uh, consulted with Balaam to go curse Israel, you know, because they had heard of Israel and how they made the people's hearts melt and how they're going to come in conquest in the name of the Lord. And Balak didn't want that, so he had his top prophet come and try to pronounce a curse uh, on Israel, but was... Was Balaam able to curse Israel? No. No. Or to the donkey to talk to him. Right. So every time that he tried to speak up against Israel, the Lord, you know, caused him to speak for Israel and pronounce a blessing instead of a curse. And he says, you know, I can't do nothing but speak what the Lord has given me. Right? That's the nature of the prophet. But in any case, Balak, being uh, this, this king of this idolatrous nation, he did in some way succeed in tempting the Israelites um, to what is called his, you know, some say his philosophy, the philosophy of Balaam. Uh, it's, it's a doctrine of compromise, okay? So what happened in the Old Testament was that in order to weaken Israel before God, you put these temptations in front of them that causes them to sin, the idol worship and the sexual immorality. And we remember in Numbers uh, chapter twenty. Four or five, whenever a man of Israel brought a woman of Edom into the camp uh, and was showing her in front of everybody, and then we have Phineas, the, the son of Aaron, came with the javelin and, and ran the man and the woman through, uh, killing them instantly and then lifting the curse from Israel because of this, this gross immorality. The Lord showed his wrath on that sin and wanted that thing to be stopped. Well, the, the influence of Edom was still in Israel. Okay? It caused the children of Israel to sin. They compromised with the Lord uh, with these uh, practices of the Edom, Edomites. Okay? And much like that we have here compared in, in Revelation 2, the, the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balaam to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and commit sexual immorality, is a doctrine of compromise. So we talked about the last church um, before Pergamus, Smyrna, uh, who did not compromise. They didn't compromise, and so they were put to death. Now, as a result of also not compromising, they were very poor. They were very poor, and they had little possessions because what they had was taken from them because they didn't run with the sinners and the idolaters. They didn't be like they are. Um, and this is a real temptation for Pergamus now to, to kind of integrate into the society around them to be involved in these guilds and, and these practices and as a result of that gain influence with the sinners and then not lose everything and not lose your life. Um, that's compromise and that's what's being spoken against um, here. The doctrine of, of Balaam and it really was you know, the root of it was covetousness, okay? They wanted to be like those around them so they would have what they had and wouldn't suffer persecution. It was, you know, as we say, the root of, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And that's the heart of, of these kind of sins is, you know, there's a pleasure and a wealth that's associated with compromise here. And we too can do that. We can compromise our faith by wanting to... Uh, run in such a way with sinners of the world that would uh, give us pleasure or give us any kind of gain at all, but at the same time, you know, walking away from the faith, being unfaithful, um, is something that is a great temptation um, to us and to the, the church there, Pergamos, or Pergamon. And so, it was a compromise, and that, that leads us into verse 15, you know, the 
the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. You know, we talked about those Nicolaitans. Uh, what other church talks about the, the Nicolaitans? Do you remember in chapter 2, Revelation? It would be Ephesus, right? Um, it says in verse 6, but this you have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Okay, so they, they hated this kind of doctrine. It goes along the, the doctrine with the uh, goes along with the doctrine of Balaam and that it's a doctrine of compromise. We don't know exactly what the doctrine of the Nicolaitans taught. Uh, a lot of people think that um, the Nicolaitans taught a form of Gnosticism. Gnosticism taught that the flesh is evil, um, and but it doesn't matter. Because you are a Christian and the flesh was evil, it's very similar to the doctrine of um, perseverance of the saints. Um, the, the, the doctrine today of perseverance of the saints that denominations teach that you can do whatever you want and it doesn't affect your eternal salvation. Much like that, the Gnostics taught that no matter what you did in the flesh, it did not affect your spirit. And so you had two opposite sides of the spectrum as far as Gnosticism. Some taught that you can do whatever you want to your pleasure um, in the flesh and it doesn't affect your uh, your spirit and then the other opposite side Gnosticism taught that uh, you have to deny everything in the flesh you you know you see people have you ever seen the movies of the, the monks you know whipping themselves with the, the whips you know kind of punishing themselves in the flesh you know, that's kind of like the mentality of the opposite side of Gnosticism. So, apparently, you know, some people believe the Nicolaitans were on the, because of the gross immorality that is spoken against here, they were coming in and teaching that you can be involved with this kind of sexual immorality, and it's okay, it's not going to affect your eternal salvation. You can run with them, you don't have to lose your life, um, you're going to be okay, you know, before God. You know, it's a great temptation. For someone to hear, you know, if you had a preacher come before you and say, "Live your life, live your best life now, okay? Enjoy everything under the sun that gives you pleasure. God wants you to be happy. It's it, you are safe in God's hands, and He wants you to be happy on earth. Enjoy the fruits of, of life, and then enjoy heaven after you die. You know what a great and heinous and awful." lie that some people teach. And that's exactly what is going on here uh, when people come in and try to want you to compromise your faith tempting you with the way to do that. Promising you safety in the eternal life um, and at the same time tempting you to hold to this, uh, this sin in your life thinking that you're going to be okay before God yeah, God's going to hate that because that's the that's the same lie that got Eve in trouble in the very beginning. I mean, you shall not surely die. You know, whenever Eve was uh, talked to by the serpent, and was talked to about the fruit uh, um, of life, and, and she took of the fruit, and just like that, you know, we have here people who are lying and saying that. You're not going to die. You can do what you want. And it's going to be okay. And, and in the end, they're, they're losing their lives spiritually and causing others to be lost as well. So it's a policy of compromise. Um, and so really, when you look at it, the doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans are essentially on the same plane. They're, they're compromises. And it causes people to, to lose their, their faith. Um, in order to uh, gain their life, their physical life. And Jesus said, um, whoever seeks to save this life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sakes will find it. Okay? And that's always been the, the, the principle of Jesus. Is it, it, it's always a, a life of sacrifice and not a life of compromise. Um, and so it says here, uh, repent or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Okay, so you have the Roman Empire 
and you have the sword of Jesus' mouth. Okay? This is a statement that's saying no matter you know, what kind of situation or, or oppressive uh, life that you think that you live, Jesus is still in ultimate power. He is still in control. Okay? The sword of his mouth. The sword, you know, in, in this time uh, of history represented the power of life and death. The power of the sword. You know, you have the power over somebody's faith. And Jesus is saying that, you know, no matter what happens to you in the flesh, I have the power over life and death. Okay, and indeed he does. And so he controls the faith of, of, of his followers, and he controls the faith of those who deny him and do, do are sinning against him. And so, um, and so we need to understand that's, that's a... To say that to this church is a reassurance that they have the Lord on their side, fighting for them, even if they lose their life. They find it in Christ. Um, okay, so you have the doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of the Galatians here. And not only that, um, it, it wasn't that only they had that problem, some who followed after these false doctrines, but they tolerated it. That is an equally bad problem in a church, is if you have sinners who sin, that's one thing, that's bad, but then you have people in the congregation who, who do nothing about it, and they tolerate it. Not that they accept it as being good, but they don't do anything about it as it is wrong. They don't discipline the, the brother or sister who is sinning. They don't talk to them about their sin. They don't try to encourage them to do what is right. And then they just um, they keep them among their number. And, and that kind of influence when you have sin in a congregation that goes unchecked can cause and, you know, a lot of people to sin. And the, not only that, if you do nothing about it, it's, you know, basically it says that you are equally as guilty, you know, as those who are actually sinning. Um, and so, we need to make sure we understand that in Pergamum, um, they have um, they have individuals who are sinning, and yet it is the church who is being admonished. Okay, he's not speaking to those individuals that are sinning. He's speaking to the congregation that has the individuals in it. And so as a congregation, when we have sin among us that goes unchecked, we as a congregation are responsible for those things. Um, and so not only is it an individual warning, but it's a congregational warning also. Okay, so... Anybody have any questions or, or comments before we move forward? Okay, the next part of the lesson is, is talking about its, its need. And we talked about this briefly already. They need to repent. Um, they need to stop tolerating. They need to be like the church at Ephesus who, who does not tolerate false doctrine, who hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, who, who, um, who does something about it. And... They need to repent, um, or else, and they need to do so quickly. That's what he says, repent, or else I will come to you quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. And so it was something that was to be done hastily. Um, it was an urgent matter. It wasn't something they could say, oh, we'll take care of it, you know, next year, or whenever the time is convenient, because they didn't have a lot of time, okay? Times were going to get very hard, and they were running out. And so, on top of that, um, souls are at stake. And that's why when there's sin in somebody's life that you, that you know of, it's an urgent matter. And it needs to be addressed. Um, because their soul is at stake. Um, it, it goes without saying that we, we don't know, any one of us knows, you know, how much life that we have left. And what's going to happen to us today and tomorrow. The Lord knows, but as far as sin in our life, it needs to be dealt with urgently um, with this in mind that, you know, the Lord may come at any time. 
and then their motivation there. Their motivation, um, again, the authority and the power of Christ. Um, it says in verse 12, at the very beginning of this letter to Pergamos, he who has the sharp two-edged sword. And again, in verse 16, it says, I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Jesus is in control. Okay, He, he wields this two-edged sword. And he's going to uh, he's going to be more powerful than even Rome. Um, the power of Rome might be satanically powerful. The power of the risen Lord was greater yet, as Barclay said in his commentary on Revelation. And that's something that you consult those brethren there. Their motivation to do what is right is that they need to understand who it is that fights for them. You know, the Christ, the risen Christ. Um, he's not one who uh, is powerless against these kind of things, but he he is all powerful. He has all authority, and he's he's he has the sword as represented here. He has the the power and the authority over over these things. And then also the motivation: He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. Okay. Where is the manna from? Who remembers manna? Yeah. All right. Manna from heaven was given to who? The Israelites. The Israelites. They were hungry and God fed them. Right. Manna out of heaven. Jesus says that he is the man out of heaven. Right. He is the bread of life. Um, God provides their sustenance. They, just like the Israelites were, were provided uh, physical sustenance by this manna that sustained them in their time in the desert all the way until they crossed the river. Did God provide for them the man? God provides for us man, just like He provides the Israelites, except our man is in physical man, and spiritual man. He gives us the bread of life. He gives us uh, this spiritual manna, which comes from His Son. You know, the hidden manna that's talked about here uh, is the unseen, right? It's the, the manna that, that exists, but they don't see it because it, it's a spiritual thing. And they have this, this motivation uh, to overcome because uh, it is Christ who provides the life. Okay? He provides the life. You know, compared to a physical life of, of sin, you know, which might be fleeting, you know, as sin is, pleasures of the flesh, you know, the sins, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, these things... They may be pleasurable for a time, but then it stops, or your life ends. And so it's very temporary. But the life that Jesus offers is, is permanent and it's eternal. And it never ends. You know, out of his mouth flows rivers of living water. And so we need to remember who actually provides us sustenance and life. Because the world can't provide it um, in all of its pleasures, but only, only God can provide it through Jesus um, and that's something that Pergamon had to had to remember. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. And so really, it goes along the same. This is a parallel verse to Revelation two ten. Um, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who overcomes, I will give him manna to eat. Okay, so it's you know this hump you know of temptation you got to get over the hump before you can you can see the glory that is that is in Christ Jesus sometimes it's hard to see you know in this life because we have so much temptation and so much sin set before us and cares of the world that distract us and, and blind us to the glory that's in Christ but you know through that jungle of confusion which is the world uh, is eternal life and so we have to get through this life, and we have to do so faithfully. We have to overcome. And it says, I will give him uh, the, the white stone. Okay, it, it has in your, your uh, notes there the, the white stone. It was actually, a, a white stone was actually something that was quarried near this, this town, Pergamos. 
uh, that they used to, uh, for, could be for various reasons, but some of the reasons are given here. It could be given to somebody uh, who was acquitted of a crime. That was the white stone of freedom, I guess you could call it. Uh, also given to a slave that was free to prove that he was a free man. He's given this stone as kind of a token. Um, given to a winner of a race. You know, around, around Pergamum and, and these areas, you find these ex expansive tracks, you know, running tracks where they would run horses and dogs and people. Uh, they would race, you know, much like our, our runners do today. Uh, unlike the runners today, they didn't have any clothes on whenever they ran their race. And so it's very, uh, you know, I found some pictures online, but I, I spared you from those pictures of the, uh, the, the statues of the ancient runner. You know, they had very little on. To, and so they were uninhibited, okay, uh, whenever they ran. But when they ran, when they, when they won, uh, when they overcame opposition, you know, as you can say here about the church here, they were given a stone as the victor, okay? Given the white stone of victory whenever you overcome your, uh, your temptations, your, your trials and tribulations. And also it's given to a warrior coming home from battle you know, uh, for his victory over the enemy. Very easily could the, any four of these represent what he's talking about here. Uh, so, you know, one as good as the other. Uh, I, I personally like the winner of the race, you know, only because I like to run, and I'd seen in other, other, other parts of the world in this time, you know, for hundreds of years, they were given something similar, you know, whenever they won a competition of some kind, a medallion, a stone, that kind of thing, um, but it's, it goes along with the crown of life, okay, we're not given a physical crown with, with physical riches, with jewels, and things like that. Um, we're given eternal life. The victory is in Christ. It's not in ourselves. And so when you overcome temptations with the power that only comes through through God in Christ, um, you are also given eternal life that's only in Christ. And so what a, what a great motivation, you know, to keep pushing forward. The, the trials are only but for a short time. And they needed to to make sure they were motivated enough to, to overcome. So that's the church at, at Pergamon. Anybody have any questions about, comments about Pergamon before we move to the next one? Okay. Uh, we're not going to get very far, but we'll get through the introduction anyway. Um, the, the message to Thyatira, to the angel of the church of Thyatira, right? These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Okay. And so the church of Thyatira here, the church that was tolerant, it doesn't sound like that through the first few verses, but that's what, you know, defines this church. Uh, before we move uh, forward, you know, we have the author, and the basic structure of this letter, letter is exactly like the other ones, you know, uh, who the author is, is, and to the angel of the church in Thyatira, right, okay, so it's the same as the other six, and then the commendations, the things they did good, the condemnations, the things that they have against them, the plea to repent, and the promise of if they overcome. Who can tell me one person in the New Testament who's from Thyatira? Anybody? Lydia, Philippians 16. She was from Thyatira. She was a dyer of purple. Remember that? And we're going to talk about that snails that were often found, or no, not the snails, that's a different city. The roots. There was a type of root in Thyatira that grew abundantly that they used. Um, that they soaked and boiled and it was purple dye and that's what they used um, apparently Lydia was a, a wealthy lady and she was very successful in her business trade and, and dyeing of purple um, who can tell me who wore purple 
Royalty, right? That, you know, it's a sign of royalty. And so you sell to the rich people, you're going to make a lot of money. And so dyers of purple back then were very successful in their trade. Um, the key verse, Revelation 2 and verse 20, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and beguile my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Okay, so this is the, the key condemnation to the church of Thyatira. This woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. Okay, we're going to talk about that next time. But uh, out of the, the list of churches that were good and bad, Thyatira um, is in that list of the four churches that had some good and some bad. Okay, which is good because then they have opportunity to correct um, and they had a lot less to work on than say Laodicea who was, seems like as we read Laodicea, they're in a pretty bad position. Um, they're neither cold nor hot and they're going to they're gonna be spewed out of their mouth. And so we'll talk about them last. They're the last church that we're going to talk about. But... Um, Anybody have any questions, you know, before we end this lesson? So, not, not a question, but a comment. It seems these churches are fairly close, not right, right next door. Right. But they, they kind of didn't help themselves, each other, out of their troubles. It seems like they had. Right. Yeah. I don't know. If, I don't know if, um, very much information as far as communication between the churches, but yeah, they were very close, 20, 30 miles at the most. Uh, Thyatira was a very, very insignificant city. It is the smallest city of all the seven of the churches, and yet it has the longest letter. So you, you, you know, that's how important the city was. Um, but uh, it used to be a significant city hundreds of years before. Uh, but it wasn't on a main trade route. It was kind of like one of the back roads, as we call it. You know, uh, it'd be Highway 103, you know, I guess, um, as opposed to Highway 69. So uh, it wasn't a very significant city, but it was known for its, uh, this route um, that I've, I've lost the name of here. I'll, I'll have to find it a little bit. But this route that you, they would take and they'd mix it with salt and boil it with water and it'd be purple. Very purple, like royal purple, and uh, they use that to dye yarn and, and things like that to make purple. Blue. So I'm a fan of purple. So uh, I would have benefited much from Thyatira, although I'm not royal, so I don't know how that would work. So that's that's all the time we have. I appreciate your, your questions and comments. <laughs> Thank uh -huh.